this lecture will be starting shortly. At URI's Harrington School of Communication and Media, every day is an exploration. With global learning opportunities and high profile internships, Harrington prepares us to be critical media consumers and creative media producers in the rapidly changing 21st century marketplace. In strategic communications. In multimedia journalism. In sports media. In writing and rhetoric. In information analytics. In digital media, film, and TV. Our tight-knit learning community is tailored to build a solid foundation for powerful creative communication. And a lifetime of achievement and opportunity. Wherever our passions lead. Discovery, opportunity, impact. The Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Visit today. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Christian Amalpour's lecture. It's my pleasure to welcome URI's president, Dr. Mark Balange, who will introduce Christian Amalpour. Thank you, Professor Kothari. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this evening. Christian Amanpour has a, had a storied career in journalism since graduating from URI in 1983. Joining CNN as an entry level assistant, she rose to the position of the network's leading international correspondent. She is known as a fearless and uncompromising journalist, and she has covered some of the biggest stories of the last 30 years. From the settings of wars, tsunamis, hurricanes, humanitarian crises, and pandemics. And along the way, she's exposed the hard truths, genocide, massacres, human right abuses, often hidden by lies. As chief international anchor of CNN's award-winning global affairs program, Amanpour, she has interviewed world leaders like Boris Johnson, Muammar Gaddafi, and Hamid Karzai and she has always asked the hard questions. Her work has earned her every major broadcast award, 11 news and documentary Emmy Awards, two Peabody Awards, three DuPont Columbia Awards, and the Courage in Journalism Award. In 1995, the University of Rhode Island awarded Christiane an honorary degree, recognizing her great career, contributions, and also her unwavering support of the University of Rhode Island and the Harrington School of Communication and Media. She has served on Harrington's advisory board and supported global experiences for students and faculty while being an inspiration to our students and faculty and an example of journalistic excellence. In 2008, she endowed this speaker series that we're celebrating this evening that carries her name. Each year, it brings national and international journalists to our campus, sharing their work and journeys, and inspiring and informing not only our student journalists, but our whole community. Here to introduce this year's speaker, CNN anchor and special correspondent, Abby Phillips, is Christiane. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Abby Phillip, for our annual Amanpour Lecture at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Abby's work as a journalist began as a national political reporter for the Washington Post. She covered the White House, and she wrote on a wide range of topics related to the Trump administration. While at the Post, she also covered other national stories, including the Charleston, South Carolina church shootings and the terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California. Abby joined CNN from the Washington Post in 2017 as a White House correspondent, and she moderated CNN's Democratic presidential debate in Iowa, and she co-anchored Election Night in America, which was the network's election coverage in 2020. In January 2021, she was named anchor of CNN's Inside Politics Sunday and the hour-long in-depth roundtable show on the week's most important political stories. 
Abby is working on her first book now, The Dream Deferred, Jesse Jackson, Black Political Power, and The Year That Changed America. It's scheduled to be released next year. The book focuses on Jesse Jackson's run for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1988. Abby's lecture this evening is titled Honesty and Authenticity in Political Journalism. Abby's extensive experience covering political campaigns, elections, and the White House makes her an ideal candidate to talk about how journalism needs to sometimes move beyond strict objectivity to understand the responsibility that political journalists have to their audience and their communities. So please join me in welcoming CNN anchor and senior political correspondent, Abby Phillip, to the virtual stage tonight. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you, Christiane, for uh, that invitation. It is so good to be with you all virtually after you know, a year and a half in this pandemic, I think we've all figured out how to turn water into wine with these virtual events, but it's given me such a great opportunity to connect with communities like yours of budding journalists and those of you who support the work that we do. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. You know, when Christiane asked me to do this lecture, I was frankly pretty floored. Um, about 11 years ago, actually, Christiane was the class day speaker at my commencement um, at, at Harvard. And um, I was a part of the committee of people who helped select the speakers. And I will tell you tonight that I suggested and pushed for her. Um, you know, at the time, I was hoping to have a career in journalism. But a decade ago, our industry was in the midst of an upheaval. And it was a period of uncertainty. And I honestly thought that her career as a fearless war correspondent and a journalist, I, I just wasn't sure that was something that could be in my future. But she was then and is now someone who I admire and look up to, and I'm proud to call her a colleague. And I was actually going through my my um, old photos and documents, and I came across this photo. I'll just try to show it to you all of Christiane and I, uh, little baby Abby there when I was a senior in college. Um, and she spoke at our commencement. You know, uh, this lecture, I chose to talk about this idea of objectivity and and a, a bit of an addendum to it, which is about authenticity. And partly because, you know, Christiane herself often talks about her time as a war correspondent covering, uh, you know, particularly after she covered the Bosnian conflict. And she was criticized by her peers and by some in the political class who accused her of bias because she was clear that there aren't two sides to genocide. And, you know, decades later, we are still struggling, for, frankly, with the same question. Everywhere I go, people ask me the same thing. How do you maintain objectivity in journalism? And so I'll actually quote Christiane. She often says that objectivity doesn't mean treating all sides equally. It means giving each side a hearing. And I really couldn't agree more. You know, for me, as a reporter coming up in the battlefields of political journalism, Objectivity and authenticity have been inextricably linked. The latter makes the former more possible. And there are days when I think the word objectivity, frankly, is overused. And people's understanding of it lacks that critical context that Christiane so perfectly described. I prefer to talk about the idea of honesty and truthfulness to decide what we as journalists are aiming to do. When I became a journalist, when I decided to become a journalist as a young college student, I was inspired to do that by the struggle of Black people who and, the, and those who fought with them for their basic human rights in the, in the 1950s and the 1960s during the civil rights movement. And when we look back on that time, it's really easy for us to see the line that divides what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. And it's obvious to us, to us now, you know, segregation was evil and that Jim Crow was oppressive and evil as well. But the truth is that those things were obvious then too. And there were people, journalists at the time, who were 
called and took up the call to paint an unflinching picture of the violence and the terror and the inhumanity, frankly, that was inflicted upon Black people at that time. You know, around the same time, I began exploring uh, that career in journalism that I, I believed was right for me, I met another war correspondent who had written for years on the front lines of the Afghanistan war. And he talked often about this idea of the ground truth, which is a kind of truth that is only ascertainable by being physically where the action is happening. And when political officials want to claim that something is not happening, you can report as a journalist what you have seen with your own eyes and heard with your own ears. And that is the power of reporting. It is the true meaning of objectivity, and it's the essence of truth and truthfulness. And in today's world, you can easily see why these parallels are important. Politicians are literally saying out loud that people should not believe what they see and hear with their own eyes and ears. They lie daily about easily verifiable facts. And we as journalists have an obligation to point that out. Objectivity is also about honesty and leveling with your audience. And the heart of that is really understanding who you are and how it affects your relationship with the world. You know, there's a bit of an old school model uh, of understanding the news business that seeks to treat journalists as blank slates, as if we are just simply megaphones for information that divinely passes through us to the audience. And frankly, that's never been the case. Even in, you know, what people think of as sort of the heyday of so-called objective journalism. None of us are without our biases and our perspectives, and we really should be clear about them. It's about honesty and objectivity. The two, in my mind, are very linked. You cannot be honest with your audience without being transparent with them about who you are and how that might impact the lens with which you look at the world and report on the world. I started my career as a print journalist, I worked at Politico, um, I worked at the Washington Post before coming to CNN. And at the time, I truly did not think a whole lot about the authenticity piece of this. I thought it was possible and even necessary to disappear from the story. And it was easier to do when you have just a byline, when people can't look at you, they can't tell what you look like or where you're from based on the name that is on a print story. But I was also taught that you can do that, that you can disappear from the story. But I was taught that by observing the mostly white male journalists who I worked with, my colleagues, because for them, it was relatively easy to pretend that who they were didn't matter to the story. And that's partly because so much of the political world and political journalism in particular was crafted with their identity as the default, as the neutral position. The reality is, and I think we are coming to understand this more and more as a society and as an industry, is that who you are as a person does affect how how you relate to your stories, how you collect information, where you look, and how you understand what you find out. Think about this. What made you who you are? You know, often we only ask that question of Black and Brown journalists, but all of us, really, from every racial, ethnic, geographic, socioeconomic background, should scrutinize ourselves in that way. Where are you from? How were you raised and how does it affect what you see and what you don't see around you? Think about this also. How does that affect how others see you? Whether they're willing to trust you, what they're willing to tell you. You know, in television journalism, where I work now, authenticity, frankly, is inescapable. People, first of all, look at you. They physically look at you. And then they might listen to you <laughs> and determine whether or not they can trust you. And as a Black woman on television, I simply cannot escape my identity. 
it's obvious to my viewers. So I have to ask myself every day, am I relating to my audience authentic authentically? Am I leveling with them the way that I would with people in my life that I care about? My mother, my best friend, my siblings. This also cuts both ways. Many people know that one day in 2018, I was covering the White House on a fairly routine day. I was covering President Trump and I asked him a question as he was preparing to leave the White House after Republicans were uh, routed, frankly, in the midterm elections. They had lost a number of seats in the House of Representatives. And instead of answering my question, he lashed out at me. He said, you always ask stupid questions. And tellingly, he said, he watched me all the time, which I think sort of, uh, it kind of told the truth of the situation. You know, after that happened, the outrage among my peers was immediate and it was understandable. It was clear to me that he didn't want to answer my question because it probed him on a topic that he was sensitive about. It, it made him angry. Um, even for a president who was who used to pretty um, tough questioning, from the reporters who cover him. But what many people saw as they watched that exchange unfold on television was bias against me as a woman and as a black journalist. And in the time since, I've gotten a lot of questions about it and I've reflected a lot on, on that moment. And if I'm being truthful, I didn't take it too personally. And here's why. You know, as a Black woman covering politics, I am used to people making assumptions about me. And I'm used to people in politics in particular, assuming that I am biased because of the color of my skin. This is something that I think perhaps I've become numb to. But in my time covering the Trump administration, I found that sources in that administration didn't trust me, in some ways by default not because of anything I said, but because of who I was. There were times when observations and those that my, when my observations and those of my white colleagues could be exactly the same. We would be saying the same thing on television, but I would be perceived and labeled as biased or as a closet Democrat. The president's allies would attack me on social media, publicly or even privately. And on the other side of things, sources in democratic politics, they often shop stories to me about race, expecting to find a sympathetic ear, or they might become angry or cold if they didn't think that I was giving them, uh, you know, the sympathy that they were looking for. And all of this, these, all of these experiences over the years have made me more cognizant of how my whole self is involved in the work that I do, whether I like it or not. And for those of you in the audience who are watching, whether you are Black or Asian or Hispanic, whatever you are, that is true of you too. You cannot separate who you are from your work, ultimately. You have to understand it. You have to level with your audience about it. And you have to even scrutinize the way it impacts your work for good or for bad. That is the kind of honesty, I think, that is required in your work, and it's rooted in this idea of authenticity. It will make you a better journalist. And when we are encouraging authenticity in our newsrooms, it makes the practice of how we do journalism more objective as a whole. When we have people from different backgrounds telling stories in an authentic way, we tell a more full picture of the world. It is at the heart of how we can restore trust in this business. Our audience, especially a younger audience, people who are coming into adulthood, they know that we are not blank slates. They know that we are not omniscient. They wanna know who we really are, who they're getting the news from. And they wanna know that we're telling them the truth. The difference between real journalists and people who are out there pushing and peddling falsehoods is that as journalists, we level with people. We try to level with people. We explain to them how we know what we do and why. We show our work and we need to do more of that because frankly, our democracy right now is in a moment of true peril and honest journalism is 
needed more than ever and more essential than ever. So where are we as a country and as a society? Well, frankly, I believe that we are in the midst of a major political realignment. And also we're in the midst of an ongoing attempt to undermine and delegitimize our democratic institution. That effort began in earnest in the weeks and in the months before the last presidential election, something that I and many of my colleagues were, you know, we had a front seat, uh, you know, view of that. Understanding that the very idea of truth is under siege is critically important in this moment. There are not two sides to these election lies. And that is true even when a major political party adopts those lies and tries to make them mainstream. And this, I believe, will be the defining issue of the next several years in our politics. As reporters, we have to be armed with the facts and with the resolve to speak the truth even when we are accused of bias. And one note, one final note, as we go into the next phase of this afternoon, you know, globally today, we are grappling with the uncontrollable spread of deceptive and false information online. It affects every aspect of our lives and it impacts every nation and every society on this planet. That too is a challenge that we need to grapple with. Journalism, obviously, on its own, is not going to solve that problem. But we can, in fact, be a part of the solution. And it starts with an unflinching commitment to the truth, which, yes, includes calling out lies. It is not enough just to tell the truth. We have to identify the lies and the falsehoods, call them out, and in some cases, denounce them. Because people are seeing them, they're reading them, they're hearing them, and we have to be clear about what they are and be a part of, re of replacing p poor information, bad information with tr things that are truthful. But it also requires us to build trust with our audience through authenticity. We have to be people that the world can trust to give it to them straight when at a time when it's more difficult than ever to differentiate bad information from good information, we need to make it easier for people to understand that they can trust us. It will be a long road. And I think we need to take this challenge very seriously. If our democracy and if our journalistic institutions are going to survive. So thank you all again for inviting me here uh, this afternoon. I am really looking forward to uh, taking your questions and answering your questions um, that I'm sure will be incredibly thought provoking. But um, at this, you know, critical juncture in the world, you know, no matter where you decide to practice journalist, journalism, where, whether it is domestically or internationally, we are at a crossroads here where journalists are really on the front lines of the truth. And it's important more than ever that we have the backbone to stand up for what is right and what is true and not be cowed and, and bowed by people who are trying to um, make journalists the scapegoat uh, when they're trying to spread falsehoods. So thank you again, URI, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Abby, thank you for a wonderful and a thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, so as a journalism professor, I would like to start with a question, and hopefully our audiences will share other questions uh, in the comments section. Uh, so I was really struck by when you mentioned at the time your time at Politico when you were writing, you know, for print. Um, you know, it was online, but it was for print, mm -hmm. and how it is easier to be quote unquote objective. But when you are on television, you have to be authentic to connect with your audience. So can you talk a little bit more about when did you realize the importance of authenticity? and all the training that you received as a journalism student on yeah. providing objectively and you know providing factual information, but keeping yourself out of the story. Yeah. I think that it is natural and normal and important to understand 
how to separate your own feelings from what the story that you're telling as a journalist. But one thing that happens when you are out in the world actually practicing journalism is that you realize that journalism is all about relationships. It's all about whether the people that you are covering and your audience trust you. So you have to learn how to identify with people. And the, I think one of the earliest moments, you know, I, I, I worked for years as a political journalist, talking to sources in Washington, trying to build those relationships, taking people out to drinks and lunches and trying to kind of develop trust that way. But I really learned it when I was in Charleston, South Carolina, covering the aftermath of a truly horrific church shooting, um, which is a phrase that shouldn't even exist, but it, that's what it was. And when I was covering that story, I had to get these families to trust me and to talk to me and to believe that I understood their circumstances and that I wouldn't I wouldn't misuse the trust that they had been that they had placed in me to tell their loved one's story. <clears throat> and in order to do that, so you have to bring your whole self into that. You know, some of these people were people who could have been my aunts or my uncles. Um, and that became part of how I connected with them. And for every person, that process is different. But that was one of the, the early times when you realize you can't do this without building those connections with people, without you sort of going in, to people and saying, I, you, can, you can trust me, you can tell me your story and I will treat you fairly because I understand what you're going through. That, you know, for, for whatever reason that is. And I think that that was one of the earliest times that I realized, even as a print reporter, because I was covering that story at the Washington Post, that you, um, in order to really empathetically tell stories, you have really got to develop those connections with the people that you are reporting on. And, but when I became a television reporter, that kind of went into overdrive because when you're communicating to people verbally, you have to communicate to them in a way that they understand. You don't, you can't talk down to them. You can't talk in overly, you know, in, in ways that are filled with too much jargon. You have to really level with people. And I think that's where things really clicked because you can be a little bit more of a whole person um, when you are communicating with folks on television. And I think it taught me a lot about the value of that and where you can fit that in, even while you're trying to tell stories fairly and tell stories in a way um, that where you make sure that you are exploring all elements of the story and helping people unpack it in a way that helps them get at the truth. Thank you, Abby. Um, so there are other questions coming in. So before we pull up the next one, um, another question I would like to ask, thank you for explaining that. Um, when you are covering uh, the White House or the politics, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, reaction, right? So there is, there's an event you go to and you're responding to that. So how do you try and balance that and still be authentic when you are really asking questions, it's on a moment uh, and you're still trying to get the information in a timely manner. Yeah. You know, um, I, I talked a little earlier about um, that exchange that I had had with President Trump at the White House a few years ago. And, you know, one of the things that um, about covering President Trump, because I've covered President Obama and President Trump, and they're very different in terms of how they respond to questioning and how you question them. And with President Trump, you know, it became very clear that you just ask the question, <laughs> you know, you want to just ask the question in its most direct and clear form. No beating around the bush, no trying to get clever about it, because sometimes he would just answer you truthfully. <laughs> you know, he would tell you what he's really thinking. You would ask him a question and just get right to the point. And it really kind of, you know, when when I when you're talking about authenticity, you don't want to 
sort of beat around the bush, even with public figures, say what you mean and, and mean what you say, even when you're questioning people in positions of power. And um, sometimes you might very well get the answer that you're looking for, or their non-answer might reveal a lot. And it takes a little bit of fortitude and perhaps some time and experience to be comfortable with potentially being on the receiving end of anger. But sometimes if you, when that's the reaction that you elicit, it means that you've gotten to the right question. So it took me, you know, some time to be comfortable with the potential that a president might be pissed off about what you had to say and be angry with you. And um, that is part of the process, especially when you're covering politics. You cannot be concerned that the person that you're speaking to might be angered by the question that you're asking them, no matter how powerful they are. And so that's really the lesson that I took away from really both stints covering two very different presidents who reacted to questions in a very different way, in very different ways. But um, it's about asking questions that are clear and that are to the point. You are not trying to um, cushion a tough question. You want to get right at it. If it's, a, if it's a tough question that needs to be asked, just ask it. Great, thank you. That's very valuable advice for our students. And I think we have a question coming up from one of our students. Um, so Leah is asking, how does your background as a print journalist help with your career in TV news? That's a really great question. And I'm so glad that you asked it because I think it's one of the things that I, I frankly tell journalism students all the time, especially you know younger ones. It is about understanding that writing is a skill that is incredibly important and valuable no matter what platform you are working in. I don't care whether you want to be a television journalist or a radio journalist, or you want to do podcasts, or you want to, whatever it is that you want to do, you need to be diligent about improving your writing skills because it is a foundational skill that helps you communicate effectively. And that's ultimately what journalism is all about. It's about communication. Um, when you're a television journalist, you're writing scripts, but even when you're analyzing things live on television, which I do for a good portion of my job, my foundation in writing as a print journalist helps me understand and organize my thoughts in a way that makes it easier to convey to my audience. And so that is the number one piece of advice that I like to give people because you cannot, um, you can't replace writing skills. It's something that you continue to work on and develop throughout your career. And when, as a student, it's something that you should be laser focused on practicing. Your television presentation, that's great. You should work on that. Work on your voice, work on all of those technical skills. But if you want to be a great writer, a great producer, a great television journalist, a great print journalist, a great radio journalist, a great podcaster, whatever it is, you should also understand where your writing skills are and work at improving them all the time. Thank you for the plug on writing. Really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> so another thing that is changing in how we teach journalism now is teaching students, you know, not only information verification, but also how to deal with misinformation and disinformation. So I think we have a question coming up um, related to that. So how do you maintain an optimistic attitude when there is so much misinformation and emphasis on political winning at the cost of truth and fomenting fear of people that are not white? Um, I think this question is from Bradley, is that right? So. Yeah, well, um, Bradley, it's, I mean, it's incredibly, it can be incredibly demoralizing. Sometimes, yeah, we look at the state of the world and we're like, is this real life? Um, there are some things that I can't really believe um, are happening, especially around the pandemic, especially around the election lies. But 
as a as a journalist, I feel like we are standing right on the front lines of that really critical battle over truth and falsehoods. And it's something that gives me a sense of purpose and and keeps me mission oriented. I can think it keeps a lot of us mission oriented because what we are doing is not just covering politics like a baseball game. It's not just a baseball game, you know, it's not a baseball game at all. It is about the truth. It's about preventing people from being misled and lied to by people in power. And I think at the heart of what we do as, as journalists is we hold people in power accountable because we work on behalf of all the rest of the people in the world who don't have the access and the proximity to power that we do. So our responsibility is to hold them accountable. And so rather than getting demoralized about the state of disinformation in the world, it is something that keeps me going when I when I go to work every day. And I think that for those of you, especially who are considering going into journalism, or maybe you're already working as journalists right now, um, you will encounter this. I don't care whether you're working in local news or in national news or whatever, you will, or in international news, you will encounter this wherever you work and wherever you go. And you have to keep front and center that what you're doing is providing an important service to the public, which is helping them sort out what is true from what is false. It's something that is becoming very, very difficult to do on their own. Um, it requires you to um, be incredibly diligent about spotting falsehoods and debunking them sometimes in your work, um, not just ignoring them. And if we are all mission focused on that, I think we can start to chip chip away at this problem. But you know, as I mentioned, I think this is a profound challenge that we face as a planet, <laughs> frankly as the technology becomes more of a part of our lives. And I think we need to all be recruited in the effort to figure out a solution to it because it's gonna be multifaceted. Thank you, Abby. Um, while the next next question comes up, can you elaborate a little bit more on how CNN deals with you know, information verification and dealing with misinformation and disinformation, you know, yeah. especially from parts of stuff? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we at CNN, I mean, I think many people will remember that um, we had a, a whole campaign called Facts First, um, even at a time when, you know, I think that it was almost it was almost before its time. It was before all of these wild conspiracy theories about, you know, election fraud and before all of the wild conspiracy theories about, you know, vaccine disinformation and all of that. And it's because I think we recognized early on that it is very difficult for journalism to function in a world in which we don't agree on what is a fact and what is not. And so that is part of what we do. But we also invest a lot of effort and energy and journalistic resources in fact checking in live fact checking events and speeches and particularly um you know when we that we just ended a four-year period of a president who um had been documented to have lied hundreds and hundreds of times it became such a big part of what we had to do just as a day-to-day -day practice of being a White House correspondent, fact checking was a part of that process. Um, we have hired people to do that. We do it on debate nights. We do it constantly as part of our work. And I think it continues. Look, when, when I talk about um, calling out falsehoods and naming them and denouncing them, that is something that we do regularly on CNN. And we get a lot of blowback for doing that. People accuse us of bias for calling out lies. And I think that's really unfortunate, but it's important that we do that. It's important that we, for example, when it comes to, you know, falsehoods around the vaccine, that we don't just ignore them, that we identify what they are and, and provide people with the facts that prove that those things are not true. So that is just a little bit of what we do at CNN. And I'm, I think that we've really, frankly, 
in a lot of ways tried to lead the way on this issue um, of truth. And it's and people have accused us of bias because we call out lies. I mean, imagine a world in which that is the case, but that is what we deal with all the time. But I think it's important that we haven't backed down from our responsibility to tell people the truth. Thank you for providing more information on that. Actually, the next question coming up uh, is about um, accusation of bias. And so as a woman of color, this is from Kayla. Uh, what advice would you give on how to handle accusation of bias? And we also hear this quite often when people use misinformation, the claim of misinformation, this is not true, to say you know, when things they perceive to be biased as well. Yeah. So, so Kayla, I mean, the first thing I will say is make sure you have your receipts. You know, come with your facts and your reporting and your work to back up what you are saying and doing. And I think your first line of defense for accusations of bias is always your work. Start with your work and start with the way in which that will speak for you. I, I talked about that earlier tonight in my lecture, partly because I think it's not talked about enough, frankly. Um, I don't think that people fully understand the degree to which, um, you know, particularly journalists of color are regularly accused of bias um, in the political sphere because they are journalists of color. And I think that it's wrong and it should be called out. Um, but you as a journalist, your reaction to that shouldn't be to let that become a part of your sense of self or, you know, don't take it personally, frankly. Let your work speak for itself. Defend your work. Don't get dragged into personal accusations or attacks. But let your work speak for itself. And I think that that will go a long way. But this is something that we have to talk about, in, especially in political journalism, because it it is something that I experience, frankly, from both sides of the political aisle. And when it's appropriate, it should be called out. But um, it's something that I just advise young journalists of color to be prepared for, because it's something that you will encounter out there. And I don't want it to discourage anyone. I want you to be prepared for it. And the preparation comes in making sure that you, you are producing work that you can defend, that you've done your due diligence, you crossed your T's and dotted your I's, you've gone to people for comment, you have the facts to back up things that you are saying. Those are the ways that you protect yourself from those accusations. And um, if you're able to do that, then, you know, you, it, those those accusations will fall on deaf ears. But I think first and foremost, I just really encourage you and anyone else listening out there that when you do encounter it, and frankly, you probably will encounter it, don't let it discourage you because you can persevere through that. Thank you, Abby. That's very valuable advice. And I think having you today as our speaker for this series is important because I think we need more um, journalists of color to also be sharing their experiences because it is different from what we have many of us have learned in school as well you know when you are going to the training what we read and the objectivity the idea of objectivity and how that shifts when you are a person of color and the accusation of bias how that changes the work you do um, so we have a next question from another student uh, as a student journalist I find it difficult to call out institutional issues on campus what advice do you have for students who want to push campus controversy? This is from Leila. So um, that Leila, this is something that, you know, as a as a college journalist myself, we encountered all the time. It is very difficult to um, challenge university institutions. Sometimes that's because some college um, news organizations are not fully independent from the institutions that they are covering. So there's that's one element of it. Um, I was lucky to, when I was in college, work at a, a fully independent institution, which made it easier. But it's also because, um, you know, you're a student, you are belong to the institution that you're covering, and that can make things very difficult. But that being said, there is so much great 
you know, impactful investigative journalism happening at the collegiate level. And it's when student journalists are fearless about pushing back and diving deep into the stories that are all around them that you can really find things that are very interesting. And you would be surprised. I was surprised as a college journalist by how many people within those institutions, professors, deans, tutors, were in fact willing to speak with you as a college journalist because they had a story to tell. Maybe they had frustrations. Maybe there were things that they were unhappy with that they wanted out there. And so you should continue to push for those kinds of connections, uh, building those kinds of relationships because you never know what kinds of stories that, um, that you will find. And within your organizations, your newspapers in particular, you need to make sure that your newspaper governance is fully prepared to back you up if you need the support. Sometimes universities push back hard on their student journalists. That is something that happens all the time and it's, it, it's a little bit normal, but in order to um, withstand that, your entire institution needs to be able to back you up and you should push for, if you don't already have a plan for how you deal with those things, make sure that you understand what the plan is before you publish stories so that you're prepared and you're not surprised when there's a lot of pushback. And you can recruit support from people within the university apparatus for your work and your reporting. So, you know, I think it's well worth doing. It's difficult to do, but I think it involves building relationships when you're reporting and building relationships when it comes to um, having defenders that are out there who will speak up for you when you're being pressured to mm -hmm. not report on certain things. Thank you. That's valuable advice. Um, we can switch gears a little bit and have you share uh, some highlights from your work. And so we have a question from uh, Mary Lynn. Um, you know, what would you say is the most impo most interesting or impactful story that you've worked on uh, in your career so far? Um, you know, that is, um, there have been a lot of different kinds of stories that I've worked on, but I think it's one that is, that uh, for me is, has been one of the most impactful was um, just at the be in the midst of the pandemic last summer, um, we were just starting to kind of come figure out how to do what we do in the middle of a pandemic. And um, we were, uh, the president, President Trump at the time was planning to travel to Tulsa, Oklahoma to do a campaign rally in the middle of a global pandemic when the virus was still spreading unchecked. And he was also doing it at a time that was um, on the on the day of Juneteenth. And I think now many of us are familiar with this, but, you know, Tulsa was the site of one of many race massacres that occurred at the beginning of the 20th century. And it was the 19, it was also nearing the 99th anniversary of that massacre. So all of these stories were really converging at the same time. And I had the opportunity to go to Tulsa and spend a lot of time there. I spent almost a week there covering that story, covering President Trump's visit, um, the impact of the virus on his rally, the reaction of the community to this rally, the racial tensions that still existed and persisted in Tulsa, even almost 100 years after this, this um, massacre occurred. And for me, that was one of those moments where, as a journalist, you are able to tell this incredibly multifaceted story, one that has all kinds of different dimensions and levels to it, where you bring all, all of your, your experiences to mm -hmm. bear. Um, and I think that that was incredibly rewarding to me. I learned a lot in that 
reporting experience. I learned a lot about the Tulsa race massacre. And it also ended up being an incredible live event because in covering, you know, President Trump's rally, the rally itself turned out to be a complete flop. You know, I was outside of the rally watching as organizers were basically tearing down an overflow space that they had prepared for because people didn't show up. And so um, it was a real uh, eye-opening experience that, frankly, you know, despite the fact that the president wanted to hold a rally in the middle of a pandemic, even his supporters didn't feel comfortable attending that rally. And so, um, you know, that was, I think, something important to to tell and the lead up to the 2020 election because it really, it kind of foreshadowed a, an uncertainty that was in the electorate about the pandemic, even among Republican voters. Trump was being cavalier about the pandemic, but even his supporters were taking it pretty seriously. And it turned out that that was one of the major factors that impacted the 2020 election. Thank you, Abby. Actually, I would like to ask a follow-up question to that. Um, I think there was a, an important period uh, in time, and I think CNN's coverage uh, was pretty good. I remember watching it at the time. Can you elaborate on the challenges that you had as a, as a journalist, you know, covering that rally at that moment in time, but also during a pandemic? Yeah, it was a surreal and challenging environment to report in. I mean, we were wearing masks in some cases on air um, at that time. And I remember, um, you know, at, at just on the eve of the rally, a lot of the president's supporters were coming out, as many of them do, they camp out for days. And we were right outside of the, the rally, just about like a few feet away from where most of them had started camping out. And I was doing a live shot. And um, at the end of my live shot, a man rushes toward me and starts screaming at me as I'm just as I'm ending my live shot. And it was terrifying. <laughs> it was truly terrifying because, you know, these rallies can become dangerous for journalists, frankly. And they can become da dangerous for journalists of color because it's, it's a hostile environment. And one of my colleagues, you know, who had just happened to be a white man had just been there in the exact spot that I was standing in and had just done his live shot undisturbed. And, but moments later, I was standing there doing the same thing and was almost attacked. And we had to have security, you know, at a lot of our um, events, we had security um, just to keep, you know, protect us from things like that that happened. And, um, they still got that that man still got very close to me at a at a um at a really scary moment and so um it was scary for a number of reasons not just because of his physical pro proximity but because he was obviously not wearing a mask in the middle of the pandemic this was before vaccines this was when the virus was was really raging all across the country um so yeah i mean i think it was a difficult time we figured out how to tell the story and keep everyone safe. Everyone was safe um, at that rally. There were outbreaks among the president's staff at that rally that we learned about during the event itself. It was a mass event in which, um, you know, people were crowded together and many of his supporters didn't believe in mask wearing and so didn't wear masks so it was a challenging time but you know we had to figure out how to tell the story safely and i'm you know how i felt i personally felt comfortable that i was safe and that i was we were taking all precautions to keep everyone who worked in the field for that week as safe as possible Thank you for sharing that, Abby. Um, so we have a few minutes left uh, before we end the event. And so I want to switch gears. We have a question um, that actually talks about um, alternative media and their role in modern journalism. So if we can have that question. Um, so this is from Mioni. Um, what is the role of descend descendant and alternative media in modern journalism? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is um, a this is, look, I think here's how I'll answer this question. In today's 
modern era where journalism in some form or another can really be available to everyone. You know, George Floyd, you know, who was killed um, in Minnesota, his death was recorded by a citizen journalist, by just a young girl at the time, under 18, who was there and decided to record the events that led to his death and was key evidence in galvanizing nationwide protests on the issues of race. And and eventually that same video led to the prosecution of a police officer for Floyd's death. That is just one example of how technology allows people to circumvent um, you know, efforts to suppress information, whether it is here in the United States or around the world. And globally, we are in a moment where authoritarianism is on the rise all over the world. And authoritarian regimes are trying their hardest to suppress technology because they recognize the power that it has to undermine their narratives. And so it's particularly important for media to um, try when they can to circumvent government sponsored narratives around the world, whether it is here in the United States or, or, or elsewhere in the country, whether it's China or Ethiopia or any number of places. And so, you know, this is a moment, I think, where, to use the term that you used, dissident journalism can be incredibly powerful and it's incredibly important. And, um, you know, I think that technology, I, we kind of bad talk technology a lot when we talk about disinformation, but it can also be an avenue for factual information and for truth. And, and I think that that is truly the upside of, you know, live streaming, live tweeting, all of these different spaces that can come into being that allow people to get things out when, particularly when repressive governments don't want them to be. Thank you, Abby. So we'll take one last question from a student journalist and uh, that is one, what is one piece of advice you have for young journalists? My one piece of advice, not including the advice that I just gave you about writing, but my other <laughs> piece of advice is to make yourself useful wherever you are in your journalism journey, raise your hand, volunteer, ask, how can I help? Can I do this? Can I help you do that? It is one of the best ways to learn how to be a better journalist. It's to learn from other journalists, to help them on big stories, to do mundane tasks, to do the tedious work that <clears throat> other people don't want to do. My very first big story was when I was an intern working for Politico and I was asked to do a really tedious, thankless task. I was asked to look through a book that was this thick, that was a database of the spending of all of the congressional offices. And I was asked to look through that book and find a story. And it took days and days of pouring through basically spreadsheets that weren't spreadsheets, it was physically on paper, and trying to find patterns. And I did. And I found, you know, the story that I wrote was about um, Senator Schumer spending exorbitant amounts of money from his Senate office on private flights. And it was a big story that made Senator Schumer very mad at me. And, <laughs> but it was an important lesson in how sometimes these mundane tasks, just <clears throat> being the one to say, hey, yeah, I'll do that, can... Um, land you on the front page of your newspaper. 
and can put you in a position where you're working with more senior journalists and can teach you something about how to be a reporter. So that is what I advise you to do. Make yourself useful, raise your hand, volunteer to help, and you would be surprised how far that gets you. Thank you again, Abby, for uh, wonderful advice and a thought-provoking conversation today. Uh, I would now like to invite Dean Riley to say a few words. Hi, everyone. Uh, a big roadie thank you to Abby for joining us today. This uh, annual Amapur lecture offers our students an opportunity to hear from practicing journalists and gain insights into the profession um, in, in live time. Tonight's focus on authenticity and reporting, how it will make them better journalists, the need to continually hone one's writing skills. Thank you for that, Abby. To always fact check, building relationships when reporting, and importantly, the vital need for truthful journalism for the sustenance of our democracy are just a few of the important points from Abby. I hope our students will take with them as they move into their careers. At the Harrington School, we're really fortunate to have Christiana Amapor as an alum and steady supporter of the work that we do here at the University of Rhode Island. My sincere thanks to her yet again as we uh, are closing out our 14th annual Amapor event. Your support can help us bring more uh, events like this to URI and to our community. Uh, please consider supporting the Harrington School of Communication and Media. And I certainly hope you'll return next year when we come back with the 15th annual Amapur Lecture, which we plan to hold both in person and live stream for our communities. I hope everyone has a great evening.